All right. Um, good evening, everybody, and um, thank you for joining Engineering New Zealand and the Auckland branch on the future of land development. Um, today, I have with me Sam Blackburn, Director of Civics, and George Sterling from Allsight, um, and they are going to discuss their Allsight product and what they see as the future of land development engineering in New Zealand. Um, and more specifically, uh, what a lot of people I've heard of interest is they're um, the future of the engineer in a post-Anthropocene world. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Sam, carry on. Um, please post questions throughout the event. Um, I'll be able to review these online and ask those questions on your behalf. Um, and for people attending in person, who are all slightly off camera, um, just raise your hand and we'll put that in order as well. Thank you. Great, thanks, Sam. Yeah, so my name's Sam Blackburn. Um, I'm a co-founder of Allsight.ai with um, George Sterling, who's the CTO of the organization. And we'll hear from George a bit later. So my background is civil engineer, um, but quite passionate about software. Um, whereas George is a properly trained software engineer and teaches me how to do my job properly. So today I'm gonna to talk about just a bit of the background on civics and allsight.ai, uh, take you through our product roadmap. Um, and then George is gonna do a bit of a dive into artificial intelligence and how it's applied to engineering systems. Um, we'll talk about some of the learning systems we're building and how they help improve the AI over time. Um, and then go through some of the other automations that we've implemented in our product. Um, and then talk about, you know, the service offering of outsourced engineering design and then cover off, you know, sort of what the future of engineering might look like once AIs and other technologies are sort of well established within sort of the design structures that we use. So Civics is a six year old land development consultancy based in Auckland. Um, we've got 40 engineers in the company, 75 total staff, and we prepare civil engineering designs on top of the ArcGIS platform. This is quite unusual. Most people are using Civil 3D or 12D to deliver um, civil engineering design. And the um, sort of extension that we've built for ArcGIS is called Allsight.ai, and it, it, it runs quite deep into the software to deliver the engineering designs to the tier. Allsight.ai is a software company. Um, it's, you know, it's sort of built on the foundations of um, the software that we've built while we were building Civics. Uh, it's a civil land development package um, built on top of ArcGIS, as I said. And yeah, it's been in development for six years, uh, but it's its first year of professional software development with uh, um, George coming on board as CTO. So our current product, it streamlines the civil engineering design um, process. We actually have a generative design, generative design AI uh, for invert design, the system's been in use for one and a half years. Uh, when we first implemented it, it needed improvement, but as these AI systems work, as you start using them, they improve over time. And now we've sort of um, got to a point where the system's really quite robust in how it prepares design. We've also put all of the um, code of practice, building consent and good engineering practice as checks into the software. So the software reports back against the designs that you give it and gives you um, sort of hints as to how to improve your design and things to look at so that your design meets standards and is constructible. Uh, our software produces 2D and 3D models, which are viewable on any smartphone, any browser, um, and all, the, all our design information is available in these models. Um, I'll show you later on, but you can query pipes and get 150 data points on all the different aspects of the design and how that's gone through to the finished product. Um, we've integrated BIM into the product, so we've got automated scheduler quantities, that's a, a one-click output of the design, and um, we've automated a lot of the drafting and output that goes with the design. And to make sure that the new features that we're implementing um, work, we've got the system running on 200 plus projects every night, every tool to check for issues with the in-development code to make sure that what we're releasing to the engineers is robust. The product that we're building and the product that we want to offer in the future is um, a sort of web portal where developers can enter our website. The only information they have to give us is the boundary of the development. Um, they can add further data, such as the product mix preference, whether they're looking for single lot or terraced housing systems. Once they specify that data, the system will then generate unlimited layout options for consideration. It'll do this using generative design AI. 
these options are assessed and designed to a detailed design standard. So if you wanted to, you could print off an entire um, detailed design drawing set of each option. These options are fully costed using our um, sketches of quantity system and engineers rates. And then the designs are also run through our QA system, which will highlight any flagging, um, any consenting or constructability risks based on those 500 checks that we've already implemented. And all of the above can be delivered overnight. So once you supply us the lot boundary for which you want to do the assessment, it'll go away off all the council data and build multiple options with um, detailed design assessments. And so the estimated sort of when we'll be able to offer this product to the market is two to three years based on our current um, sort of development rates. And now I hand over to George, yeah, CTO, to go through AI. weird. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm George Sterling. So as, as Sam mentioned, I came on board to allsite.ai yeah, just basically the beginning of this year, but I've been involved, I've known Sam for 14 years. So I've been involved with it, with what he's been, been building for, for quite a few years. But yeah, what I'm here to do today to talk to you guys about is, is give you guys a bit of a background about artificial, of what artificial intelligence is. So maybe first of all, to you guys, what does like how do you what do you think of artificial intelligence or, or what springs to mind when I say artificial intelligence? Yeah, learning. It, when, when did you guys first come across artificial intelligence? Terminator. Terminator. Yep. Yep. Now that, that was like my my story it was it was probably Hollywood movies, um, The Matrix, all these these movies we we grew up on where this these science fiction movies where this artificial intelligence kind of creates a, has a conscience and and takes over humanity and destroys humanity, which is, yeah, maybe it's the future, who knows? But um, I, I guess I, I wanted to explain a little bit about, about AI. It's not something that's new. It's actually been around for a very, very long time. Um, so here at this timeline, artificial intelligence in the 1950s is where it sort of kicked, really kicked off. But the concept of artificial intelligence has been around since the Greek, Greek times. Like philosophers have been talking about this for a very long time. Um, I guess they were trying to, uh, they were attempting to logically describe what is happening in a human mind. And that was that's sort of the, the, where artificial intelligence first sort of kicked off or the concepts of it. But it, it rammed up in 1950s um, along with computing because all of a sudden there were tools available that allowed um, some of these concepts to sort of take, to take place. And, and that's when artificial intelligence actually was, was sort of like really born. Um, but it's come a long, a, a long way since then, and as computing power has become more powerful, we've, we've been able to apply, um, we, can, we can throw a lot more data at things, and we can, uh, artificial intelligence has really come, come along and grown. Now, there are three types of artificial intelligence. Um, the first is, called, is often known as artificial narrow intelligence. That's everything that everything anyone talks about today that's in the artificial intelligence world. It's artificial narrow intelligence. So that's basically where you're, you've got a single task that you're applying AI to solve. And it might be um, Google Photos trying to like recognize faces. Um, it's just a very simple task, automated driving. Very, I say simple, but single task that it's trying to, to automate. The next type is artificial general intelligence or often known as strong AI. And that is where um, an artificial intelligence has basically got human capable um, Capability, so it's it, it's mimicking a human. Um, it's got the you would be it'd be indistinguishable indis whether it was a human or computer. And then the third, which is the Terminator type, which is um, artificial superintelligence, which is actually when it exceeds a human's capability in learning and growing, and all of a sudden humans are a subspecies almost. And this is a bit of a hypothetical. It's only that, you know we, we're not there obviously yet. Potentially, we'll get to artificial general intelligence um, within our lifetime. Um, but I think artificial super intelligence, it will come. It will just be not maybe our children's children's lifetime. I think we will get to a time time when that, when that comes. Um, so artificial intelligence, it branches off into lots of sub categories. It, it's not all one type of artificial intelligence and, and I'll, I thought I'll maybe just dive in a little bit into machine learning because that's the one that most people are exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's one application, machine learning is one application of AI. Um, now the beauty of it is you 
it's like your your tagging of photos um, and it automatically detects other people that look like that person that you've tagged. What you're giving it is you're giving it some inputs, some images, and you're giving it some expected outputs. We're saying this, we're tagging this one, this person, we're saying this person is Sam. This photo here is Sam and this photo is Sam. So we're giving it some the outputs and it then will use that to then work out what you give it a new photo and it goes, is this Sam or not? And it's, it's just a, basically a statistical model, it's all statistics. Um, now, that's amazing because it, it's, you don't need to program any logic that says, oh, if it's got a, this colored hair and it's got this eye shape, that it, it is Sam. It's all based on data. So you throw up more data in the algorithm, it gets better and better and better the more that you tag um, those images of Sam. Now that works great for a lot of applications. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about machine learning is because we don't think that it really fits the civil um, design problem space, like throwing AI at it, because you get changes all the time. And then that could be a planning change. Um, the Auckland Council brings out a new planning change. So now you've perhaps trained a model up with thousands and thousands of data sets, and all of a sudden the planning change renders that completely useless. So it just doesn't really suit um, unless you're going to invest a hell of a lot into training these AIs and constantly updating it, which is what something like the self-driving cars do. I know Tesla do a lot. They've got approximately a thousand um, labelers who are labeling images to determine whether this is a stop sign, um, et cetera. Now, Tesla have got the same issue when they, it, perhaps all, all the data they've trained is in the US, but when they want to release their automated driving in New Zealand, perhaps we have a different type of stop sign or we have other signs that perhaps they haven't trained on. So you got to, you have to label all of that as well. Um, so this is something to be aware of. But there is this thing called deep learning, which is where you get AIs can kind of train themselves a little bit, but it's, it's got its own limitations. I'm not gonna go into the details there, but yeah, there are a lot of branches of AI. And the one that we think is best suited for civil design is generative, generative, generative design. Um, so Sam's gonna talk about it about that a little bit later. So there's um, generative design, um, or maybe I'll just cover off one other type that I thought was pretty cool. I only learned about it today, generative adversarial networks, which is where you um, build up a two competing systems and they sort of fight with each other to build a better system. So you, you think of deep, deep fakes, you know, like deep fake image um, videos. Well, you set up two AIs, one to create the deep fakes and one to detect the deep fakes. And then you get them to basically compete together. So each one's trying to outsmart the other one. And so they're getting better and better and better and better. And that's how deep fakes work. That's, it's, well, that's how some of the algorithms have been developed using that um, generative adversarial networks. It's pretty cool. But generative design, um, this little giphy here explains how it works. This is um, showing potential designs of a, of a, um, of a apartment co complex. And we've, it's, the whole design has been parameterized and basically you've got very, like, uh, throw a lot of computing power at it and you vary a whole bunch of elements. And then you determine what's the best score. Now, the score that they've given here is, it looks like it's based on energy usage, construction costs, daylight access, access to transit, walkability, and the number of residential units. And they're trying to, so iterating millions and millions of different combinations to come up with a good score. And so that is generative, what generative design is. And um, we think it's very well suited, suited for the civil, the civil problem. So yes, yeah, Sam will talk a bit more, more about that now. So thank you. Yeah, so generative design has Sort of three main components. You've got the parameters, which is the inputs to the system that you're varying to get the result you want. You then have a scoring system, which is a way of measuring the output of the design and whether that's a good outcome or a bad outcome. And then you have an algorithm, which is varying the par parameters to seek out your, um, you know, maximize or minimize that score. The implementation we have for our pipe network invert design is our parameters of the system inverts. These are the inverts, the manholes, the pipes, the tanks. Um, all, all the different underground infrastructure that we're putting in place. Our scoring system works off cost. So there's three factors that we're looking at there, the capital cost, which is the cost to build the asset, the operational cost, which is the ongoing cost to maintain that asset, 
And then a third category, which is external costs. External costs are costs that the design of the asset puts onto other external features. So a good example of that for our pipe design is bridging costs and foundations. So if our pipe is set within the angle of influence of that building, you will have to bridge that foundation and there's associated cost with it. So our system detects that and applies that as a cost penalty in the model. So when it's optimizing that pipe design, it's taking into account its effect on neighboring um, pieces of infrastructure. Our algorithm to solve this problem is in-house developed. Uh, it actually assesses all possibilities and then summarizes them as it goes down the network to come up with the overall um, global optimal solution for the design. And as I touched on before, when we first implemented this system, it certainly had some issues, but over time we've improved it to the point now where uh, we're constructing 250 lot subdivisions and not having to set a single invert in the design. Um, and it's saving us sort of weeks of design time on our land development project. Um, this sort of successful implementation of this generative design has given us the confidence to really invest in the software team and sort of go forward with more ambitious projects in this space. So the roadmap for our AI systems, uh, we've got our system invert, design, uh, system invert design and it's complete and in use. Um, we're currently building our site levels thin. Uh, it's testing at the moment and we're hoping to have that in the hands of our engineers in a month. Um, the site layouts AI, which works similar to the Jiffy that we saw before, is currently in development and we've hired um, some of the top algorithm, a top algorithm engineer um, to, to come on board to help in our development of that. And then um, we'll be looking at infrastructure layout and levels. So currently we have an AI for designing the inverts. We're also going to have a, a, a system that will design the layout of the infrastructure as well as the inverts. And we'll kick off work on that uh, component of the platform next year. And then finally, there's an AI which underpins all of the different systems that we build, and that's around system improvement. So that's an AI taking the engineering overrides and then trying to improve our cost models so that we'd get the result without the engineer having to override them. And that development's planned to kick off in 2024. So this is touching on the sort of the constant improvement of the system. So a quote from Elon Musk, uh, Tesla CEO is user input equals error. Now that doesn't mean that the engineer's input is wrong. It means that if the system required engineer's input, then the system is wrong. And so all of the um, input that our engineers have to put into our system is taken as learning data for the system to improve. Um, so all of our designs start with the computer generating the design and then the engineer overriding the aspects of the design that they don't like. Now, if our system only gets 10% of the design right, that's a lot of effort for the engineer to go and override 90% of the design. But if our system gets 80% of the design right, then the engineer only has to override 20% and that's a net cost saving in terms of how they produce the design. That is also, as they override the parts of the design that the computer hasn't generated correctly, they're also tagging that data for us, for the system to go and learn and improve how it applies um, and implements its AI system. So each night, our AI system will take the overrides that the engineers have set, and it'll modify the scoring system, including potentially adding new scoring relationships to better fit the engineer's corrections without regression on the other aspects of the design or other projects, because there's no point in changing it if, um, if it makes other jobs worse. Recommendations will then pre be presented to the software engineering team in the morning and assessed for implementation. Now, if it comes up with relationships between things that don't reflect real world design um, considerations, we won't be putting them in because that's what's called overfitting a model. And um, it basically means that it's just fitted the data that it has, but it hasn't really improved the system overall. Um, but if the suggestions it comes up with, we agree with as engineers and think that that does reflect what the design um, changes that we'd want to make to that system, then we'll implement them into the software and then it will have improved. And so that's how the learning works. It's kind of automated learning, but with a manual check and a manual sense check from engineers to make sure that it's um, actually improving over time. Other automations that were implemented, um, these are simpler um, sort of software 1.0 implementations, such as automation of drawing view sections and labeling. And there's a whole list of things that we've built over the last six years that we've got currently in use and uh, a couple more that we're planning to do, which is um, automatic catchment delineation, which is a combination of the software approach that they used to generate the city's overland flow path layers combined with the connectivity of the pipes in the buildings. Um, and also getting our two flow and EPA net models to automatically set the scope of what the model needs to be to accurately model the flooding or water networks on the site. 
currently our engineers have to draw the boundary of the model and then it'll automate generation of the model and the output. Um, but we're looking to sort of take that step out and automate that as well. So the reason we're building this system is we want to offer sort of outsourced design services around New Zealand and around the world. Um, so we're currently seeking regional partners in New Zealand to work with on the system. And we're creating an online web platform to effectively deliver designs to anyone around the world. I'll jump into a wee website demo and you can see what we're building. So this is our online web platform, which we're using to um, sort of um, author our drawings through, carry out all our quality assurance, and also work with um, engineers that could be located in other regions or other parts of the world to allow effective QA and sort of quality assurance of designs that we're preparing for them. Um, with each drawing release, uh, our 2D model will be updated. So you'll get access to sort of an interactive drawing um, you can query the data on it, um, bring up sort of asset information. It's a very rich system and this works great on mobile too. So you can just pull out your phone and look up at the latest 2D models for the site. Um, it also generates a 3D model at the same time. So every time we say something's ready for a review or release, it'll regenerate these models. So you can trust that when you open our website and look at the 3D model, it's the latest uh, model for the site. And um, is fully sort of interactive. It's a particular key combo to get it to rotate. Um, but these also load really fast on your phone. And I've been using these on some of our development sites and just being able to whip up a 3D model in your phone, roll it around on site and see exactly how the designs intended to be constructed has been super helpful. Um, and you'll see here that all of the information contained within our databases is um, able to be pulled up and queried. Uh, so this is you know, got all the tank specifications there. We've also got a PDF markup system integrated into the website. So you can do the traditional markup of the designs for what you want to get out of it. And um, our whole quality assurance system with all the um, sort of checks from the software go up to the website. So our designer will comment on it. And then the reviewer can also comment on it and you can kind of agree on, you know, the different aspects and, and what you can produce. You'll get a file history, file history of your release, so you'll get a DWG, all the usual file types, a schedule of quantities every time we do a release because that's been automated. Um, and you can also view the schedule of quantities tables within the site for every release. You can also be able to look at a history of um, what the cost of the design has been over time as your design progresses. We've also integrated a Gantt chart system. Um, so this is a common platform for the contractor and those involved in the site to plot out how the how the job's going to go and how, how, how you're tracking against your original plan for the project. So this system's going to be going live with our engineers in approximately two months and then we'll be um, sort of releasing it to external parties once it's tested well through that system. So Final comments on the future of engineering. So we see these AI systems as changing how a lot of the design processes work. Um, we sort of see the future as an outsourced engineering design because these systems are so kind of um, inherent and in, in being able to improve, improve they, they need a really tight system to do that, um, which is sort of the model that we're going with with foresight.ai. Um, we see the engineer's role in the future as oversight of AI-based design systems. The engineers will certainly be dealing with the really complex parts that AIs can't handle or haven't encountered before. Um, but in dealing with these difficult situations, um, the engineers will eventually teach the AI how to deal with those situations. So um, the, the cases of um, design issues that AIs can't handle will get more rare over time. Uh, AI is a very long way from being able to deal with clients, from being able to manage construction, um, a general intelligence that George sort of talked about, a human level intelligence is not just around the corner. These things are hundreds of years away. So, um, but 
AI can certainly replace simple problem solving functions of engineers and potentially more complex problems over time. It's best at optimization of a large number of simple constraints. So TIN design is one that I think uh, and a, a generative design AI is really well suited for. Um, site layout, it's more about a whole lot of simple considerations that you're trying to optimize rather than a few really difficult um, scenarios. But it can't think outside of the box because you're very much defining the box that it should operate in and connecting it up to learn. And um, it's not going to come up with some new idea because that simply isn't isn't sort of how the software is written. So um, they'll be targeted at specific tasks and they'll make those tasks very, very fast. To give you an example, our generative design um, pipe that AI can design 500 pipes a minute. So you could design an entire city's pipe network overnight with it. Um, but that's all it can do. It's not going to drive your car. It's not going to do other things. Cool, so to summary, we took you through our project roadmap, um, sort of giving you a bit of a background on artificial intelligence and how we're applying it into our learning systems at foresight.ai. Um, we've touched on some of the other automations that we're doing and taking you through what um, we're looking to offer in terms of an outsourced engineering design product. And yeah, sort of thought about some of the considerations for once AI is all, all through engineering and how that might change the way in which we work. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thanks, Sam. Um, we're online, um, but I'll open up the room for any questions. Has anyone got any questions? A great function. So um, do those simple analysis right at the beginning and dive into it as you go and learn a bit more about it. Um, it's great that you don't think that it's going to take over our, our jobs or our roles, but um, it is a, a fantastic opportunity to actually um, get people thinking a little bit more outside the box um, and and we can do things a little bit better. So thanks very much. Yeah. No problem. The, the sort of value add that a civil engineer adds to civil engineering. Um, it's not doing manual hand calcs, something that a computer can do better. And we've already seen a, a sort of a revolution when CAD came out, you know, people were doing things by hand and all of a sudden we got so much faster by doing, by these CAD programs that allowed you to quickly draw things up, save them, undo, edit, do, do all that. So that was a big revolutionary change. We see the next change is that you don't actually interact with CAD software at all, but you're guiding the software. Um, you're still the brain behind it. And that's, that's where we think that we think civil engineers can be a hell of a lot more productive in the future because they won't need to do a lot of the stuff that they have to do nowadays because a lot of it's like quite meaningless tasks, well, not meaningless, but um, very simple tasks that often grads do or you know people with it without a lot of civil engineering experience. There's still a lot of value add there and we see that it's just going to change. People will become more productive that's the way the world has been going with in virtually every industry is people are getting more productive. Um, we've seen it happen in software development. It's in my background, um, it used to be very slow to do software development and it's got faster and faster and faster as you know, now there's AI and the, when we're actually typing code, actually AI that auto completes the line of code you're writing because it knows what you've been writing in the past. It speeds up our job. We can write more code and we can at a higher quality. So, you know, that, that's the way we see it working in civil engineering. It's just the quality increasing, speed increasing, and therefore the cost decreasing um, for developers and and for, for engineering firms. So it's, it's a kind of a win-win the way we see it. Um, you can get more out of everything. Perfect. A uh, question online from Ben Addington. Um, do you see non-engineers being able to use this? Um, and how do you believe that council officers will view these drawings? Um, we produce normal PDF drawing sets. We currently do it and um, we've got really good feedback on our drawings and the level of detail, which we can show because on every job, it's producing all the detail every time because it's been automated. Um, certainly developers will be able to use it for scoping. There's going to be a big red disclaimer down the bottom saying that a real engineer hasn't looked at this and use this at your own risk. Um, but we will allow them to draw a lot and get generative design, get some cost estimates back, um, but entirely at your own risk. 
unless you engage us to actually look at as a, as a real engineer. And to touch on the point before about, you know, I, I don't anticipate a design getting through and the computer generating it perfectly for at least five years. Like we'll build these systems, but I don't think they'll successfully design a whole job for five years at least. Uh, but they will save us a ton of time in preparing that job along the way. Okay, perfect. And I think that that answers Kathy's question of how many projects does the AI need to learn and trust results. And I think the translation is five years worth. Um, it's, it's, you're not trusting the, the AI is your junior grad just out of uni. You've taught them to use the software and they're doing some designs for you. Like that's what the AI is. It's not the senior chartered engineer signing the work off. You know, it's supervised, it's checked. It's just a different way of doing the drawings. You know, there's um, CAD houses in India that you can go to, they're cheaper. You know, this is a replacement for that. It will deliver quicker. It will deliver higher quality, but you got to look at it and you got to still review it just like you would anything else. But the nice thing is it only makes a mistake once. Once you program it, never make that mistake again. It doesn't do it. And, and we've found that with our software that some of the earlier mistakes we made, we've never seen again. Um, whereas if you were just relying on the training of your engineers, they'll, some will make the same mistakes over time. Try the software. This software is. I mean, can we try the software like a, a one month trial period or something? Oh, you can try it on um, any projects. It's not a subscription model. It's it's uh, you would work with us. We'd provide you a design system. We aren't offering access to the software directly. You'll be liaising with our engineers producing the designs and the drawings. You'll act as the the, the local engineer on the ground signing it off reviewing our designs, but it's instead of you having a design crew in your office, you're utilizing us for it and uh, the plan is that we'll deliver it cheaper to a higher quality faster, um, then you could do it at cost. Um, for a bit of background, it's been an interesting couple of years with Engineering NZ where we've been discussing the future of engineering and the profession within New Zealand and the, um, you know, the, the AI singularity has sort of identified that for the next, uh, at least until the horizon of 2050 which is where ENZ has drawn the line, um, and 2030 for our initial, we've got the, um, the idea of how the engineer's professional role is going to act as a, as a wide knowledge base across multiple disciplines with multiple understanding of how elements work, including people, environments, social elements, et cetera, et cetera, and then relying on these uh, specific outcomes. Uh, like stormwater engineering as an example, which will fundamentally almost be taken over by AI. Um, so it almost still have the human element to go against that at the complex engineering level, CPENG, if you like, uh, to be able to knit those elements together and make it right for New Zealand Incorporated or right for their community. Um, so it's quite interesting to see that it's already coming through and what you've been saying mimics almost out of that black room session. It's great. Um, a question from Yi. Uh, just wondering how the engineering clients accept slash trust, that word's come up again, uh, the AI models, as most of the time the models are complex and hard to explain, especially if you're using deep learning models. Uh, our clients see an end result of PDF drawings that are reviewed by a chartered professional engineer and prepared by an engineering designer. This, they don't know. <laughs> Developers are really interested in it for the speed at which we could do things with the generative design, but, you know, whether it, Great engineers prepared the drawing or whether an AI has done it, it's either here or there. You review the long sections, you review the plans, you either like them or you don't. So we've had engineers, some of our chartered engineers from Harrison Gress and other companies, and you know, they, they ultimately are happy with the design and, and release it. Um, there is no AI direct, talking directly to a client, that's for sure. <laughs> what about in terms of flexibility? Uh, with the software itself, like uh, there's all these changes that come through. Um, yeah, so you can override any part of it. You just set the overrides, and it's much similar to setting the inverse. You, know, you just set the override field. So it'll then re-optimize around those overrides. So if a particular pipe is at a particular level, it'll re-optimize the upstream and the downstream to it. And if you needed a whole pipe alignment to be at a certain level, you just set it. So, and then those overrides are used as training data for it to give you those settings next time, so that you don't have to override it. Yeah, that would have saved me weeks for a sewer design I've just reviewed. <laughs> um, question online, uh, can, can the software do pavement designs required by Auckland Transport? 
maybe for your next version. Uh, present day, the pavement designs are done by using Circly and Ospads, or Osroads, I think, uh, or is this only for drainage and earthworks? Um, so we do designs in Circly and then um, when the site fits those parameters, we're used to design. Um, so we've sort of done a, like a grid of circular designs so that we've got like a range of tables to look up a particular design and then we'll use that design. So when we encounter something that's not covered by the data that we've pre-generated, we'll then go and do a whole bunch more circular models to, to do that. So it's sort of automated, but we're not trying to replace the circular engine. Um, that would be yeah a lot of work for quite a niche part of what we're doing. Do you have a patent for the software? Uh, no, we don't. Um, it's hard to patent these sorts of things. So um, generative design has a structure and everyone sort of, it's well published how they work. Um, we've talked to IP lawyers and we could patent some of the cost functions we have. We could also just not tell anyone what they are and obscure them through source code protection. So um, yeah. It's, it's hard to know if there is anything patentable here and certainly um, the protections afforded by that are questionable. Has there been any thought process of automating the backtracking uh, process or the supervision, uh, supervision of the AI? Oh, so supervision automation? I mean, of, has there been any like ideas at all? of uh, automating the backtracking or the supervision of the AI system? I've certainly had ideas about fleets of drones flying a site every day and you just sit in your central um, hub, but uh, I believe that the airplane rules heavily forbid that. Yeah, um, you'll have to get an office on the top floor as well. Yeah, but uh, we do have plans to build a site component to a design whereby the sort of ITPs are automatically generated and then you, you do it on your smartphone to, to fulfill all the quality assurance requirements for an asset. Um, but certainly, yeah, it's not, it's not going to automate site inspection anytime soon. Uh, Stephen Riddler, is there not the risk that the engineer doing the oversight will start to doubt themselves and think the software must be right? <laughs> um, when it gets it wrong, it kind of gets it quite wrong. <laughs> like it's, yeah, we certainly haven't encountered that yet. Engineers are quite sure of themselves. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a great question I, and I think it, it definitely re reaffirms what you were saying before where the software is a tool it does not replace the engineer for another hopefully a couple of decades until i retire at least i don't think it'd ever replace the engineer until you talk about a uh, general human level intelligence um yeah and that's not those tesla robots that you've seen it's it's 100 years away hopefully <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my staff is scared of. <laughs> um, interesting question online from Wilson. In terms of computing power, uh, currently, do you need a specific computer to run it, e.g. a workstation? Uh, no. Um, I managed to optimize the generative design for the pipes to design sort of 500 to 1,000 pipes a minute on a um, normal kind of Intel laptop processor. Um, so that just runs locally. Our two flow models are sent off to a server which has, you know, sort of Ryzen 5, 950, so it's sort of top of the line processor, but it's still not supercomputer or anything. Yeah. I think, I think this next question's well above my pay grade. Uh, how does this all tie into Godel's incompleteness theorem? Can a computer find something that is probably true, but is in fact a false statement? I'm glad you're looking at George for that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to come in frame as well, I think. <laughs> no, I, I hardly even got the question. I was like, I didn't understand the question. No. Um, yeah, probably not a, not a good one to answer in like five minutes. I'll probably go away and research it for like a week and then come back and answer it. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, that that's a curly question that I always thrive to find at least one of in these forums. Oh, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, have we got any more questions? Thanks for the presentation, guys. That was really good. Um, 
how much importance would you place on civil engineers upskilling and coding, uh, coding given the development of such softwares and who will be left behind, if anyone? Um, drafties or at risk? Yep, just to be frank. Um, coding is a difficult one. So we've wanted to offer programs to teach the civics engineers coding and like do an evening or something. Um, but in talking with George, uh, unless you're really doing it four hours a day, you're not going to get good at it. So it's hard. Uh, and we've had some of our engineers say, I'd like to learn coding, and they considered taking a job at the software company and stepping down to half time. But it's a huge sacrifice. You know, I can't pay someone that's new to coding what they get paid as an engineer. Um, so it's a really hard one to answer. Like, I'm obsessive about it, and I probably do code still four hours a day. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to just pick up a little bit. You're not going to be able to do this with just a little bit. Um, you'll be able to do some simple scripts and stuff, but a system, to be honest, will blow, blow those scripts out of the water. So it's, yeah, it's, it's something that's hard. You're either, I guess you're either a software engineer or, or if you can do it like me, but sort of 50-50, um, then that's ideal, but there's not a lot of career opportunities, well, other than coming to workforce, right? And I think that ties in quite nicely with some of the other discussions with ENZ as well, is the, um, you know, the, the engineering specializations that are constantly emerging and coming out, biomechanical, um, environmental engineering 20 odd, 30 years ago, all of these new outcomes, software engineering, um, and finding that opportunity to embrace software engineers into the profession. Um, they are an engineer, they work as an engineer, and this is an example of how they can operate in, in an engineering field that we're familiar with, with a new technology and a new standard. I just thought I might just add to that, um... There are some people, we have one of them, who've come out of uni with a conjoint, civil and software engineering. And I imagine that will become more common, that you'll start seeing people, um, and, and it could be through new, new degree offerings, um, where it is a sort of like tech focus, focus or maybe like AI, civil engineering type specialty. Um, I could totally imagine something like that happening um, over the next five to 10 years. And I think, it, to be honest, I think it needs to happen. Um, because, you know, in like my background is not civil engineering. I've got a lot of upskilling to do in that domain. I'm a software engineer by trade, but they are very two very different forms of engineering, like engineering schools around the country. They do offer software engineering and civil engineering are two separate degrees, and you spend four or five years at, at uni studying those. So they are very, very niche at the end. doesn't mean to say at the end you can't get crossover. Sam's evidence of it. I'm evidence of it crossing over the other way. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's, I always encourage people to get into software development because I think it is the future and there's a lot of programming languages that make it really easy. I think it's, it's never been easier to start to learn how to program than like you literally can do it all in your browser. You don't need to download any tools and there's websites that allow that, that helps teach you how to code, but you need to want to. And I, I think a lot of people are like, I want to, but they're not willing to, it's like learning any new skill it takes whether they reckon 10,000 hours or something to be proficient at anything, whether that be like in, any new skill, um, a Rubik's Cube, solving a Rubik's Cube, you need, to, you need to learn that, right? And that's the thing with software. Um, it does take time. And you, you'll, like with Sam, I think he's, he's spent a lot of time learning software, but I've had to almost like rewire his brain into how to actually develop. Yeah, it's, it's, it's software engineering versus programming it's they are two different things software engineering is like civil engineering you know you're actually you, you're you're creating a it's a fun like a process to developing something um you don't just throw some pipes and dig you know start digging in the ground and lay some pipes and she'll be right and, and that's kind of the difference between programming and software engineering it's it's you actually it's a you're taking a, an engineering approach to, to doing something to solving a problem so yeah i'd encourage anyone to get into software yeah use um google how to learn like python is a great programming language if you're going to pick a programming language choose python because it's very low barrier of entry to get into it um you can write that they call it a hello world program where it just prints hello world in like uh, five seconds like yeah you you can there you go hello world we'll start there so yeah and and you've got to start somewhere. Um, but it's also good to maybe start at the other end and learn more about AI and, and learn about, because a lot of that, you don't need to learn how to code up. 
but you need to learn how it can be applied. So understanding, like you can learn a lot just from Googling. Um, so yeah, it's approach it from both both ends. You don't need that full stack. Uh, one more question for Sam, and I think then we'll call it because I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, you have completed several projects so far. Uh, what is the time and cost saving on average for land development that you've seen? Not willing to disclose. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Significant. Good, 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 good. Um, all right, uh, we will wrap it up there. I do see that there are multiple questions on, but I am conscious of the time. Um, so I'd like to thank George and Sam on behalf of Engineering NZ Auckland Branch for presenting. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And of course, if you do have any further questions, I'm assuming that there are contact details on allsite.ai. We will add some if there isn't. And yeah, please reach out to us if you want some outsourced engineering design because we're, uh, we're offering it now. Fantastic. And if you've got any other questions, I'm sure George is contactable around uh, philosophical outputs on artificial intelligence and programming. He's going to be studying up. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much and um, good night.